Hello. Good afternoon and welcome to the Urban and Environment Panel session. This panel will touch on how geospatial tools are used to build sustainable geosmart cities and how visualization and analysis of spatial data assist in urban planning and the environment. Let us now welcome our speakers, Eugene Lau, Deputy Director, Urban Design Technology at URA. Welcome, Eugene. Heron Boss, Program Manager from TNO Amsterdam. Dr. Arai Motoyuki, Founder and CEO of Synspective Japan. And Winston Kressler, Senior Sales Director from Planet. Welcome, gentlemen. Let's get Thank started. You. Hello, thanks. How's everyone doing today? Great, well. thank you. Very well, thank you. So the first question for today, I'd like to start off with this um, opening question. How is your organization using spatial data and geospatial technology in your line of work pre-COVID times? And now we, when we are in the new normal, what, how do you see the industry adjusting and innovating to the trends? Maybe Eugene can start first. Eugene, would you like to share first? Hi, yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry, my, my connection was pretty bad. I, I kept dropping out. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Okay. Sorry, Vanessa, could you repeat the, the question again? I, I didn't really catch on just now when uh, I dropped out. Yeah. How has the line of work and industry changed um, as you see it pre COVID times to the new normal? And what's the trends that you foresee in the next five years coming out of this? Okay, uh, I mean, coming from the Urban Redevelopment Authority, we, uh, we deal with the, the approval of buildings. Uh, so, uh, I mean, and we have many different guidelines in order to control the, uh, the look and feel of the building. So some of these guidelines actually deal with the built form of the buildings that will result in uh, features in buildings like, for example, sky terraces and also the ventilation of buildings. So one, one trend that I do foresee uh, ever since the onset of um, of the COVID pandemic is that there would definitely be a trend or a change in the way we use uh, buildings and the building spaces. Like for example, public space, which uh, is something that we always uh, encourage and propagate in the URA. But with the impact of COVID, uh, the, 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 the design of public space would have to change inevitably. Yeah, maybe in the future, we would no longer propagate the design of one huge public space, but instead, I mean, for example, hypothetically, it could be a cluster of public spaces that's distributed all across the buildings in multiple levels instead of just one big uh, public space. That's one example. And um, another uh, trend that I would see, uh, maybe not so building oriented, would be with regards to the use of data. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to uh, design of buildings, site meetings, uh, uh, design evaluation. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I, I understand that it's really quite uh, uh, well used in terms of like, for example, BIM uh, submissions to the authorities for evaluation. But with COVID, the opportunity to meet up and to actually discuss on projects would be even more uh, rare and feel. And hence, it would be even more important that the data that the authority receives is even more accurate and reflects the uh, project that's on site. Yeah, and by that I am referring to examples like, for example, BIM submissions. Yeah, and even for the developers and the architects themselves, they themselves would actually have to have even better uh, 3D data, you know, BIM files or whether it's uh, GIS data and all sorts of data. It would be even more important to ensure that everything is accurate yeah, in order for uh, uh, productive discussions. Thank you, Eugene. Heron, um, your work is, is in urban mobility planning and research and also mm -hmm. in digital twins. Perhaps you can add yep. your comments as an extension to the first question. How do you see the use of digital twins that can be utilized to help plan the cities better? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, the, um, well, before COVID, uh, we used digital twins to plan urban space and to plan the mobility uh, in relation to urban space. Um, now, due to COVID, um, we see that uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, there's a lot less being traveled, but maybe uh, even important, there is a reluctancy to use public transport. Um, so there is a large model shift from public transport to uh, use of the roads, uh, a car uh, in the Netherlands, also bike, 
So that's a good thing. Um, but it also learned us that uh, a lot of the authorities and the public transport providers um, have their models to predict um, trained on the basis of the pre-COVID situation. Um, but they have no insight of the underlying motives of people, why they move, why they show the patterns that they show. So in this new disrupted situation, they have very limited cap capabilities to predict what is going to happen when we uh, unlock or when we uh, when we uh, quit with the with the with the measures. So what the actual impact will be? Um, uh, well, it seems hard to predict. So what we are doing, we uh, we connect um, more microscopic data from our national uh, statistic, statistics bureau on the um, actual uh, activity patterns of people, not the movement patterns, but the activity patterns of people, uh, and we connect that to the uh, to the movements. And we use digital twins also to predict and monitor what is happening. So we can also see uh, how the patterns change and how the model shift change. So how people move from public transport to the road. So we can predict better what the impact will be of new measures. Do you have some slides that you want to share with the audience? Yes. What I can do is... Uh, I hope this shows. Yes. And I will put it, put it on presentation mode. So uh, our organization, um, uh, TNO, uh, is a research organization for the Netherlands. We are independent from government. Um, so we work for uh, governments, national as well as international. We also work in, in Singapore. We are represented in Singapore as well. Um, on a very broad uh, range of topics from defense to healthcare to traffic and transport where I work. And what we actually do, what our mission is, is to make uh, technology, uh, knowledge applicable for society and business. Um, and what I mentioned, um, building digital twins, um, uh, well, pre-COVID, uh, we noted that uh, in order to get a uh, to get a grasp on um, uh, what is happening in the complex system of a city, you have to combine data, uh, you have to combine uh, models, simulation models, and in order to start up a process where people can discuss uh, and literally stand around the table discussing what is what's happening uh, if, um, we had to make these um, models very fast and interconnected. So that's why we built an architecture uh, that enables us to interact with the data and immediately see uh, uh, what the impact of measures uh, will be. So basically, we created a digital twin on many different um, uh, interconnected topics. Um, we coming from the unit traffic and transport, obviously we start with mobility. As I mentioned, mobility demand. Uh, we, when we assign that, you get um, a traffic or the use of public transport. Uh, nowadays, also mobility on demand or mobility as a service. Um, and we can calculate the um, uh, calculate and measure uh, the related impacts on the environment, but also important the impacts on uh, the energy system, for instance. And uh, we work together with LTA in Singapore uh, to see what the impact of uh, the electrification of the entire bus fleet will be uh, on the operations of the bus fleet, but also on the environment, as well as uh, on the energy grid. And then, um, so basically what we do is we create these digital twins, these dashboards that allow us to, to, have a, to create an integral view on the city and to yeah, you could say literally stand around the table and see what's happening when we when we interact with this data. Well, um, uh, mentioning COVID, this way of working, uh, as you see, standing around the table physically, uh, which is very um, how do you say helpful to to get insight and to get a discussion, is now being done online. So we are we are very happy that we can also provide the digital twin via web, interfa uh, web interfaces. 
um, but it changes the way that you interact with each other. So that's something we have to learn, how you get the same uh, quality out of these kind of discussions. Thank so you th very that's much. what the slides that I wanted to, sh to share with you. So it's actually bringing new ways of working and how imperative communication um, is, has to change right now yep. and how the platform has to be evolved as well. Thank you, Heron. So okay. our next two speakers, Mocho-san and Vincent, will share their perspectives from the satellite industry. Sinspective from Japan looks into Sinspective Aperture Radar Satellite Solutions and it's a GeoWorks Geotech. Mocho-san, what trends do you see for the new normal and for the next five years? Yeah, so, uh, so I think our business is not, has not been changed uh, by the corona effect, I think. But uh, our, one of our important mission is providing the uh, uh, new data, satellite data. Uh, so especially uh, sa satellite can uh, detect the shape uh, of the building and the ground terrain data. So I think it's very helpful for, uh, yeah, digital terrain. <laughs> So development, and we can update the data very high frequency. So uh, I think it's very helpful for uh, the uh, I would say uh, the reduction of the infection risk. So I mean, we have to develop the new community selection uh, based on the uh, digital twins uh, simulation. So and the, there are so many kind of a data is uh, required to develop that and the updating is also required for that. So uh, uh, we have the many kind of the new data renew, uh, relevant to renewable energy and telecommunication and maybe 3D printers for uh, distributed production. But the decision making based on the data is very, uh, it's very important. So I, I think it's learning from the uh, COVID uh, experience. So, uh, to avoid the panic. So uh, we have to accumulate the data, update the data, and then uh, we can build up the uh, simulation. So, uh, so that's why uh, our uh, business has not been changed. Uh, but uh, I think the remote sensing uh, engineering and the digitalization uh, yeah, has been promoted more than before the conventional situation. So, uh, yeah, I think we have to develop the appropriate system for that. Thank you. Thank you, Moto-san. Vincent, over to you from the optical satellite solutions view perspective. Sure, I think COVID-19 presents a challenge to the entire world as a whole. Uh, we are seeing that there's a, lot, there's a lot of lockdowns, a lot of uh, restriction of movement across borders, right? Uh, at the same time, within the country itself, many, many things cannot be measured when you cannot be physically there. And I think the use of satellite imagery uh, during this COVID situation is, has become more and more important, particularly in uh, things whereby we are, we are seeing movements of human beings who are being displaced. Uh, we are seeing displaced persons being, being displaced in, in countries in, uh, well, in South, South Asia. Uh, we have seen displacement of uh, people in the Western part of, uh, of Central Asia. I think those, those those patterns are being tracked by satellites, uh, and these are people who are actually being uh, neglected in terms of uh, the COVID situation itself. I think in terms also for food security, which I'll talk about later as well, uh, I think it's also becoming very important because we've also seen the, the logistics flow of, you know, of humans, uh, the, the food itself. I think we were also, in Singapore, we were discussing how many percent do we need to be sustainable, 30% food supply, right? Uh, we are, many countries have become so much focused on so, so stabilizing the food supply and knowing where their food is coming and going to, right? So agriculture uses of uh, satellite remote sensing together with, uh, I think, SAR, you can, you can also do, do the same thing, uh, has also pretty much increased a lot. Uh, we see a lot of demand in this market because of, uh, because of the current situation. Uh, I think post-COVID, uh, people will, I think there'll be many, many small businesses coming up seeing the opportunities. I think in every crisis, there's always an opportunity, right? Uh, there will be probably many, many, uh, you see that potentially partners coming along, uh, joining, joining uh, us or using data from uh, Synspective, right? Uh, to work on problems together to solve the world. We are, we're not going back to where we came from in the past before COVID, right? So it's going to be a new, the new normal. The new, new normal will call for very mobile, fast responding technologies that will be very efficient for use by industry and people. Thank you.
Thank you, Vincent. Yep. Let us now delve into the importance of good data and how good data will help the industry to effect optimized solutions. Eugene, you apply geospatial data and systems in planning and urban design. Perhaps you can comment on your use of different formats of data to bring about new methods for effective planning in building geosmart cities. Sorry, I was on mute, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess first and foremost, I, I would have to give a quick snapshot of how planning is done uh, in the URA. Yeah, because planning itself is really a, is a multi-stage process, especially when it comes to um, the government doing the planning. I mean, it's not a consultancy, but it's really uh, planning that starts from the scratch, uh, starts from the beginning, whereby it's macro scale, whereby you look at the concept plan and the master plan that's reviewed almost every five, 10 years to a time frame of up to 50 years. And then it starts to uh, translate into more fine green plans, like for example, the structure plan or urban design plans. And eventually it also transforms into reality. And how is that done? It's actually done by using land sales method, like for example, the government land sales uh, program that we have in the URA. And that comes with uh, planning and urban design guidelines that we package together the sale of the land. So that it's very transparent when a developer builds um, something, they know what are the requirements of the government. And after they, they finish the design, they submit to the URA for approval and subsequently to all the different authorities. Um, we review the design, we check if it's in compliance with uh, our guidelines. And finally, if it's all, uh, all okay, there's no problems, then we approve it and they go ahead and build it. Of course, subject to the approval of the different authorities as well. So in a nutshell, this, uh, these are the different steps and the different processes of uh, how we do planning in uh, the URA. And uh, as you can see that there are really it's, it's a pretty complex process, um, at many different stages. Therefore, we really need different types of data and high quality data. I'm not talking about um, uh, poor, poorly modeled 3D models, you know, uh, rubbish in, rubbish out, right? And at the same time, we also need, uh, I, I, I guess I would like to highlight that we need a good fidelity of data. Fidelity meaning we don't just want one type of data, which is very high definition. At times, especially like, for example, if I'm working on the concept plan or the master plan, whereby it's really macro scale, designing the city, planning the city at a, a city level, I only need a lower fidelity data. So it's very important to have different types of data that's available for our use at different stages mm -hmm. of uh, the planning process. And some of the examples would be like, for example, uh, I mean, all thanks to SLA, working with NRF to develop the, uh, the 3D digital twin that we have for the city, in city GML format, which is a great format for us to use at certain stages. And as we pro progress to, let's say, for example, the design, the detailed design stage, when the architects and the developers start to submit um, the 3D models into URA, nowadays they do so mostly in BIM, for, uh, BIM format, building information model, and that's a different type of data altogether. Yeah, and completely different types mm -hmm. of fidelity. But each useful for its own purpose at different stage. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, let's say, for example, at the urban design level, whereby we also dive down, it's more or less in, in between level, whereby it's between the macro planning and the detailed planning. Uh, because I myself, I'm trained as an architect and uh, we do urban design um, uh, in my office. So at this stage, we do need an in-between level and we, we sometimes we mix and match different qualities of data. We import the BIM files, we import the CTGML files, and then we start to do analytics, like for example, shadow simulation, solar irradiance simulation, traffic simulation, wind flow simulation, all these types of simulation. Yeah, so there's no one clear uh, type of data that would be perfect for every, every purpose. So that's why I feel that it's really very important uh, to summarize that mm, we, it's very important to have good data and also a variety of good data. Thank you, Eugene. Um, for city planners and also um, architects in, on this uh, webinar as well, we are welcome to also check out the SLA 3D Singapore Sandbox on JoeWorks website to find out how you can simulate your designs um, prior to the physical um, actual uh, project. So a question for Hiron, when you talk about the twins, what kind of data simulations do you produce and what kind of data do you use in your projects mm -hmm. and platform? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, well, the digital twins we built are really uh, uh, building an integral view on cities, uh, combining spatial planning, uh, mobility planning, uh, environment, so uh, air quality and noise, uh, as well as uh, the impact on the energy grid. And it's uh, a bit dependent on the exact use case, what kind of data we need, but um, uh, land use and buildings uh, up to 
well, uh, the level of detail depends on the on the use case exact, uh, exactly as uh, Eugene uh, uh, mentioned, actually. Um, uh, when it comes to traffic, um, what we need is uh, not only the, the traffic that we can observe, so not only the traffic counts, but also the underlying patterns, so the origin destination matrices uh, from where to where people move. Um, uh, and for instance, the, the supply of transportation uh, in the form of um, uh, public transport, for instance, and, and that quality. And when it comes, when we zoom into uh, the environment, so the environmental quality, um, uh, well, we can calculate from our models, uh, given the amount of traffic that we measure or simulate, uh, how much uh, emissions there will be, so how much pollutants uh, are emitted or how much noise is produced. Uh, dependent on the, um, the, the the urban form, so the the, the buildings and the uh, and the, the shapes in the environment, as well as uh, land use, uh, we can calculate the propagation or the dispersion of pollutants. Um, so we can calculate concentrations also um, uh, with a temporal um, uh, pattern, so how it changes uh, the, over time. Uh, and we can combine that, and that makes it extra, how do you say, valuable if we combine it with sensors measuring the actual values on some places so we can validate, validate what, we, what we calculate. Um, so these are the different type, types of data that we can combine uh, in a platform uh, and that we need to build up one integral view uh, of this city. Thank you. Thank you, Viron. Vincent, Planet looks into Earth observation and providing satellite imagery solutions via optical satellite. How does your solution help in climate change, perhaps in the food security space and land usage? Sure. Uh, thanks for the great question. Maybe I can share my slides. Uh, okay. Hope everybody, hope everybody can see my screen. Uh, I think in particular for, for satellite images, we contribute in several ways to the sustainable development goals of the UN, right? Particularly in uh, zero hunger, uh, clean water and sanitation, sustainable cities and community, climate action, of course, and uh, land on land, uh, uh, life on land. I think these are the main, there are, of course, there are many different smaller areas that we contribute to, but these are the main areas that, we, that I foresee that we contribute to. Uh, out of this, let me talk, talk through some examples. Uh, especially, I mentioned earlier about agriculture. In, in satellite images, I think traditionally, even since the 90s, has been a ma major contributor to the growth of precision agriculture in the market. Right? Uh, I, I recall when we first started in this industry about 15 years ago, uh, people were already using our data to look at, you know, using SAR to look at rice, field rice fields in, uh, in Vietnam, right? to look at the growth and the pests that are affecting the, the rice paddy field in, in southern Vietnam. Uh, pasture management, and also the seeing how sustainable such food uh, supplies are, are also a very important part uh, in, in satellite uh, data analysis, right? Uh, but in, in recent years, there was also very the growth of many, many small startups coming up, especially in countries like China, countries like Japan, where we are they're looking at agriculture finance, agriculture insurance, uh, to look at how sustainable the practices of certain farms are uh, through, through very high tech techniques such as satellite images uh, to, to do certain form of financial analysis on these companies. Uh, these, are, these are all major growth drivers that we are seeing and for SDGs, for, for, for satellite images. Uh, just a few examples. One of them will be actually in Colombia, where similar to what, what uh, Eugene is doing, uh, environment permits planning, uh, the use of satellite images to look at uh, how people are using the land uh, to see to see whether there's any illegal use and modification of uh, land use where it's, where they're not supposed to, I think especially for very large land masses like uh, South America or places that's tough to go to, right? I think it's very valuable for planners, very valuable valuable for people who want to track land use, especially even for taxation purposes. Uh, happening happening right now in California is a uh, major fires. I think we have all seen pictures of uh, of these fires in on, on news media. Uh, I think we are helping the Californian government to track all these forest fires and uh, divert important resources to all these places where, where fires are happening. We are also contributing to the efforts in Singapore and this, in this region to track fire as well, uh, where we track almost the, the fires of, of our neighbors every single day. Uh, to, especially we are we're lucky this year, there's not much burning because everybody's locked down, I think. Uh, and 
I think these are these are actually something that satellite images contributing to sustainability, right? Uh, for disaster management in an earlier slot, I think one of my so a few of my colleagues have already discussed the, the disaster planning. Uh, earthquakes, typhoons, floods, all can be effectively monitored by satellite images. Uh, I think this one very excellent example where we combine a 3D model uh, with a satellite images to monitor potential landslides uh, in, in the Italian Alps. Uh, I think this, this particular concept has also been used in, in countries like uh, Nepal, in Bhutan to look at how to look at how potential communities may be affected by disasters caused by landslide uh, and I think these are what we do uh, to help the SDGs in the world. Thank you. Thanks Vincent. Um, yep. If you have any questions please um, place your questions in the Q&A box. We have one question from Bailu. How does Planet Solution work with TNO solutions to create digital twins? How does or how can you guys work together? Okay, let me let me propose something to you, Joe. Uh, I think I think we, we our data together with uh, data from perspective, right? We can be a very good input layer uh, to 3D models that TNO is using, right? If TNO needs to update any land cover, I think for satellite mm -hmm. satellite images can be a very very good uh, input to 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 what is being used by by digital twin. Yeah? The context yeah, information yeah. is very important. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I agree. Um, for building a digital twin like we do to build simulations, uh, uh, getting the right data and, and uh, having a solution that is scalable, so to say, that is the big challenge for us. Uh, so a combination with a party that can provide scalable data, uh, yeah, that, 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 that would provide a good opportunity, I would say, yeah. Maybe you can have a virtual handshake, gentlemen. Of course. <laughs> so, um, over to Motosan. So Motosan's Inspective provides star satellite solutions for your clients. Can you share about the trends that you see in disaster management and climate change? Mm. What are the challenges and opportunities that you see? Okay, so, uh, okay, so before that, uh, let me introduce about the South Technology feature. So, and then I go forward to the uh, turning point. So uh, the South data has the feature which uh, is, it works even in nighttime uh, and even in any weather condition because if uh, active microwave is provided by mm -hmm. satellite and the reflected microwave is captured by the satellite again. And we can, uh, and then uh, I, as I explained, uh, we can get the grand terrain or uh, the shape of the infrastructure data uh, yeah, in any weather condition. So it uh, brings the very big a benefit, especially for data scientists, because they can get the constant data even in rainy season in Asian region. So, uh, yeah, of course, the uh, combination uh, of the since uh, uh saw data and the planets, uh, how can I say, uh, optical satellite data. The combination is the most important to identify the specific object and uh, uh, detect uh, change in the specific economic situation. So anyway, uh, the cell satellite can uh, provide the uh, constant data uh, for a solution. And uh, yeah, and then it works for uh, this uh, disaster situation very well. So uh, disaster mitigation process uh, consists of three parts. So first one is uh, preparation. And second one, uh, uh, response for this uh, disaster. And then recover ring from uh, disaster uh, damage. So uh, the first, uh, yeah, so preparation is already, uh, how can I say, introduced by uh, the digital twin use. So we can simulate uh, the disaster situation and then we can prepare for the emerging, uh, how can I say, urgent uh, situation. Uh, maybe we can identify the best, uh, we can simulate uh, the optimum uh, escape way and uh, we can, how can I say, uh, simulate the, uh, the expected damage and the risk area. And then we can avoid uh, to set the very important uh, infrastructure uh, such as power plant and water treatment plant and maybe bridge uh, from the risk area. And then we can redesign the uh, other structure. So that's a preparation uh, phase. And uh, yeah, and in that 
hyperspace, the SAR satellite data can provide a very high frequency, maybe daily data for a specific cities and the community. So I think it's very helpful for the uh, updating of the data. And uh, it's very good for the digital science, as we mentioned. And uh, in the second phase, uh, response for the disaster. I think the SAR satellite data have the biggest impact for this. So uh, we have a plan uh, to increase our satellite, SAR satellite, uh, to 30 SAR satellite constellation. So this number, uh, I'm going to say, means that, uh, okay, if the big disaster happens in any place in the world, one of our satellites reach the place within two hours. And after that, our analytics, our uh, analysis system can uh, uh, detect the data, usable data uh, from the capture data. And uh, then we analyze and, we, and then we can provide the valuable information uh, to contribute to the risky activity for governmental entity or maybe people directly within one hour. So totally three hours after disaster happening. Uh, it's, how do I say, it's the little time to begin the risk activity. So I think it's very big change uh, compared to the current situation. So our cell satellite system is very important for, uh, it's very important as a social info information infrastructure in that situation. And uh, uh, also we can utilize the data for recovering, uh, including the replanning of the optimal time a structure, a city structure. And also we can monitor the many projects at once, even in uh, expanded to broad area at once. So uh, then, yeah, it's kind of a big data because uh, I think the many data set comes from not only our satellite data, but also the other IoT sensors and uh, yeah, settle the new IoT sensors included. So uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I say, so that's why we need to utilize machine learning technology to leverage the remote sensing engineer's capability to analyze the data. And then uh, we can identify uh, the progress that maybe the big, uh, if uh, we can get uh, the big gap between the progress and the plan. And then maybe uh, something illegal activity happens here. And then a uh, fraud auditor or manager visit there, and then we can identify the, uh, how to say, illegal activity. So uh, we can improve the uh, investment for that, uh, efficiency of the investment for that. So uh, let's say, I'm gonna say. So these three steps, uh, I'm gonna say, preparing and the response and the recovering. So our, our SAR satellite solutions, not better, our solutions can contribute to uh, cover all of uh, these issues. And then current challenging point is lack of the data because uh, satellite development is very uh, difficult technically. So uh, currently uh, some startup uh, company and uh, yeah, also a big conventional company also try to develop the South satellite constellation, but nobody achieved it. So uh, if we can overcome this challenging point, I think uh, how can I say we can achieve uh, this yeah, valuable system for disaster mitigation. Thanks. So the demand for real-time data is um, mm -hmm. just out there. All organizations want real-time data. But uh, I think most of the the discussion before, uh, when you were saying that there's so much amount of data and you see clients having um, huge challenges in identifying what is good data. So how would you advise clients, organizations to manage mm -hmm. this problem? I can open this um, question to the rest of the speakers as well. So, so you mean data management? Yes, yeah. data management. Uh, I think, yeah, still a uh, totally point. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I expect that uh, some of the uh, cloud platformers uh, improve the efficiency of this uh, data management. But anyway, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, kind of technology is under how is development. So uh, these, especially these two or three years, I think uh, we can analyze uh, uh, rapidly compared to uh, the conventional situation, and also we can provide it uh, very quickly. So, uh, but 
But I, in addition, I think, uh, I'm going to say, the more good, I'm going to say, uh, way to find out the appropriate data to uh, detect the uh, needed information. Uh, if the data management uh, can solve uh, this uh, problem, uh, yeah, I think it's very, uh, it's very helpful for uh, solution providers. A question for um, Hiron. Can TNO solution be deployed on-premise? Yes, it can. Uh, so um, the solution that we have, uh, uh, we can uh, when the, we can deploy it uh, uh, on the premises of uh, of a user of a municipality, a city, a country, uh, or we can uh, fully deploy it in the in a cloud. So uh, we are um, uh, how do you say flexible in that. Um, when it comes to data management, that also touches a bit on uh, the data management. Um, because, well, actually there is a lot to say about that. Um, uh, when we started with our solution, and maybe the other gentleman will recognize that, um, we started building it with an off-the-shelf uh, commercial uh, uh, database product. Um, but, well, soon, well, when the, the amount of data uh, grew, um, the off the shelf data solution uh, uh, became the bottleneck of uh, uh, the amount of data that we need and the speed that we have to process the data. So now we, uh, we basically created our own data solution that allows us to, um, well, to consume much larger amounts of data and to keep it uh, uh, in memory so we can process it much, much faster. Um, then, and when it comes to data management, you also well have to validate it with some ground truth, so you you gain trust. Um, but also working with municipalities or cities, and we are sometimes um, well, we are an independent organization in the Netherlands. We we're we're not from the government, uh, and especially when we do it uh, uh, outside of the Netherlands, um, we need um, uh, uh, the, we need to use the data that is trusted by the users. Uh, and that is uh, something on top of the, how do you say, objective validation. There has to be trust or else you get first discussion on the quality of the data instead of a discussion uh, towards the right solution. Um, and the last thing that is that has come up uh, recently uh, in Europe, but I think uh, uh, everywhere is privacy. So uh, um, the, the, the rules with regards to privacy are very strict. Um, so uh, that um, puts extra requirements on your data uh, uh, management as well, because uh, 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 leaking data or being hacked uh, will lead to very big fines in, in Europe uh, if you put, uh, uh, um, how do you say, if you violate these privacy rules. Thank you, Heron. <laughs> Um, I think Heron has to leave right now to go for his next session, which is about TNO's urban strategy. So thanks, Heron, for joining us. Uh, for the rest of the uh, speakers, we still have some questions to, to um, pose to you. Vanessa, so maybe one point point yeah, sure. on um, data management. Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I, I really do agree with uh, the points that Heron has just uh, highlighted about the importance of data privacy and also the importance of data validation as well. I mean, while um, coming from the perspective of the government, of course, uh, uh, you know, normally people think that government has a lot of data. We are like very powerful and we can get data from everyone that we want, which is not true because at the end of the day, we need to respect the privacy and uh, the source of the data. And uh, I, will, I would also like to highlight that um, data itself, while uh, we can collect data, but there are many times that data has to come from ground up. Yeah, meaning it has to come from the source of the whether it's a developer or the architect, in order to sustain the database and to ensure that it's consistently accurate and updated. So it's almost like a, a tangle between the government and um, the, the private industry, because more often than not, we really do need the help of the private industry to, sus to help us sustain the database for us to plan uh, efficiently and uh, to plan, plan smart. Uh, but at the same time, they often tell us that they are worried about the, uh, the protection of the data. So we, we it's, the role of government to ensure that the, there is proper legislation in place and there is proper framework for data governance in order to convince them that it is safe for them to share the data with the government 
and for us, and it is solely for the use of the government in order to us to force a plan better for the people living in Singapore. Yeah, and I'm sure this applies to many other cities and countries uh, all over the world as well. Thank you, Eugene, for sharing. Um, so a question from Stan Hui Fu for Eugene as well. Post-pandemic, do you think there will be a significant changes to urban design at the precinct level, residential and central area in the commercial uh, space in Singapore? Oh, definitely. I, 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 without a doubt, uh, personally, I feel that there will definitely be changes, um, whether it's at a precinct level or whether it's at a... I mean, I, I guess when you're talking about commercial central area level, you're talking about maybe uh, F&B outlets, or you're talking about office spaces in the CBD. I mean, looking at all of us now, we're dialing in from home, yeah. So I, I would foresee that the, the usage of office space and the demand for office space definitely will, ch will change. Yeah, and that will also impact the way we sell land in the next five years or even in the next one year, because uh, it really depends on property research and uh, data analytics to inform us, you know, like how, what are the types of office space that developers will need? or rather office uh, users will need in the future. Do they need such big offices or should we reduce office space into a smaller typology, a new trend, you know? How do we hot desk? How do we work from home? And what's a good mix and good balance? And um, with regards to changes to the precinct level, uh, I think I mentioned earlier as well, like uh, one good example would be the use of public space, especially if let's say touch wood, the vaccine takes a long time to be developed and um, yeah, and there's like second wave, third wave, fourth wave all over the world. I mean, the use of public space would, I mean, it would be rendered use, useless, especially, I mean, Singapore is okay. I mean, we're still out there running and exercising, but in many countries, it's not safe to be out there in the parks and playgrounds. Yeah, it's totally not safe. And I would say that not only in Singapore, but it will also apply internationally in, in terms of the design of public spaces. And uh, like and you mentioned, in this, the design of residential apartments, right? Um, Personally, I would say that maybe in the design of residential apartments, we really have to be careful in the way we could tweak our policies and guidelines because uh, we cannot forget that we live in Singapore and this is a terrible pandemic, but it is not a disease X. It's not going to wipe out the world yet. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah, this is very, very grim. But we have to be prepared for the future pandemics that will hit us. So it's, it's important to ensure that we do not go ahead with a knee-jerk reaction and change the policies completely. Yeah, one, one, good, one good example I would like to flag is that you, we, of course, you know, with COVID, we want to naturally ventilate our spaces to ensure that uh, we do not live in an aircon environment because, you know, you don't want the virus to keep uh, being transmitted from room to room, right? But at the same time, don't forget that we live in Singapore, we're subjected to the haze. So what if we go and change the guidelines and say that, oh, you know, nowadays buildings need to have X percent of natural, natural ventilation. But when the haze period comes, the haze comes in, what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it contradicts one another. So, so these are the issues that we have to tackle with, yeah. But uh, no doubt that we, we, many agencies are working together right now, the government along with, uh, I mean, URA along with uh, uh, agencies like BCA and Parks HDB, we're working together to study this whole situation and to come up with um, um, guidelines to tackle the situation if it doesn't get better. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a consensus that um, partnership and collaboration is so much more important now. Um, as uh, TNO and Planet uh, were uh, discussing just now, um, as well as I think Planet and uh, Sinspective, you see also areas for collaboration. Um, and uh, Eugene, you mentioned before as well about interagency collaboration. So um, you're all coming together from different ecosystems. Uh, Eugene, just one question about Space Out. What, uh, can you share more about Space Out and what were your findings or learnings from that um, the app that was built by URA? Oh yeah, so this, this app was actually developed by one of my colleagues' team, um, the Digital Planning Lab. And uh, from what I, what I understand, the, the idea actually came about uh, when they were just um, doing safe entry themselves and just having coffee and they thought about, why not, you know? I mean, this was actually still during the circuit breaker period and a lot of people were concerned, you know, like if I go to this mall while it's open, I just want to buy food for my dinner, you know? Is it safe? Is it very uh, crowded? And how do I find out you know, what's the intensity of crowd over there? And then this also applies to public spaces as well. Once again, public space yeah. in parks, in shopping malls, in playgrounds. Yeah. So with the safe entry data that uh, people check in, check out with your phone, the QR code, um, what we did was that uh, URA started to work with the developers to actually get hold of all this data. And uh, with the use of geospatial technology, actually congregate the data into hotspots, you know, like based on postal code and development postal code. So that you have your parks, you have your shopping malls, you have your, now there's even a sports layer, yeah. So people, before they leave the house and they want to head to a destination, they can actually 
check space out to ensure that uh, this place is not overly crowded before actually making a trip there. If not, then you can always look for alternatives to go to another nearby mall which is not as crowded in order to reduce the risk of themselves being exposed to uh, the COVID virus. Okay, one final question for each of the speaker. Uh, maybe we start with Winston. What is on your tech and innovation wish lists for the urban and environment space? Mm -hmm. If there were no barriers, what would you like to see in the industry in terms of innovation or anything else? Sure, no barriers. Space has no barriers. So let me think of the things that has no barriers, right? I think the, the most uh, wonderful thing that I feel that uh, can be done in this, in this post-COVID situation actually is to for, for more state uh, support in terms of funding for research by, by researchers who are researching into issues that are directly affecting the lives of citizens, right? Uh, we can parallel certain uh, initiatives like in the US where NASA is sponsoring researchers all over the world, right? Uh, to, to read, to, to use satellite data to anal anal analyze uh, environmental problems, right? Uh, there's also a program in ESA uh, that is, there's free satellite data to, to researchers from all universities and to people who need to study certain kind of environmental issues, right? That can be done. But uh, I think Joe Works is doing a very, very good job of putting everybody together. Uh, must really praise the team in Joe Works who, who are coming, coming, doing a lot of effort over the past few years uh, to bring all different people from all over the world together. I would like to see a lot more of that. I think uh, for, if the state, if the Singapore government uh, can, can actually play a key role being a hub, uh, being a hub for, for just visual data, being a hub for bringing together industries all over the world, right? You, got, you have brought perspective to Singapore. That's a, one of the best things they have, they have done in a long time, right? Fantastic. Uh, another thing that I would like to see actually is, uh, I think from a, on a more personal note, I have uh, young children who are very interested in space uh, and geospatial. Uh, we, sh we, could, we can do a lot more in terms of space education, right? Uh, just an example, Planet right now, right now has got a K-8 K8 uh, education program in the US for children who are interested in spacecraft. The topic last week is how big is our satellite? So they put a, a huge satellite and they put our satellite, they put a Koji, the top down there. They see the, the, the different size of that thing. I think making, making space very interesting for young children is very important for our next generation, right? Uh, Singapore is a very small country. Uh, we, need to, we need to find out what, which is the next big thing that, that help drive our GDP, which, which will help us grow the young people's aspiration. I think space is always a fascination. With Elon Musk flying, flying his rockets on SpaceX to Mars, maybe to Venus next, right? I think Singapore, maybe you can send our first astronaut to space eventually, if we have enough education. Yeah, that's my view. No, no barriers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brother Winston, uh, Winston for, for that. Um, yes, the, the reason why we are organizing GeoVic is to bring everyone together to learn about geospatial. Also, I remember last year when the team at GeoWorks, we were at InnoFest Unbound, and Suspective brought their satellite over to Singapore. And we also are learning how to um, assemble the satellite uh, with a small team and within three or four hours. So. So it's always a learning experience for all of us. Uh, so Motosan, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that the business viewpoint is very good. Uh, <laughs> a good point. And uh, yeah, I totally agree with it. So uh, I'm going to say, uh, the one startup uh, cannot take the very big risk. Uh, and uh, But unfortunately, the space development will bump uh, business and uh, yeah, maybe education is included. So uh, the uh, business uh, needed needs a uh, long span uh, until uh, the success. Uh, that kind of a business is very, uh, has a high risk uh, for the startup uh, players. So uh, we have to separate, we have to make it more compact risk and share, sharing uh, with, uh, with the uh, other startups and other uh, yeah, big companies, maybe uh, including governments is very important point, I think. So the job works, uh, uh, I'm going to say, yeah, it works very well uh, to achieve that kind of, uh, to develop the eco ecosystem, uh, to share the appropriate risks. And uh, yeah, and I think, so the, yeah, maybe it's the space business uh, future. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, it's very big, big risk. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, as a, uh, uh, Eugene uh, explained that it's kind of open data, a ground truth data included. It's very important to uh, verify 
the space, uh, the data comes from the space technologies, satellite technologies, and this is also one of the important step to achieve the uh, to commercialize uh, the business uh, to commercialize the space technology. I think uh, the how can I say there is a big trend uh, in space business. Uh, the main market, uh, the conventional main market is government, was government. But currently, uh, it's shifting uh, from the governmental user to uh, industrial users. So I think it's a very big chance for uh, commercializing uh, as an industry. So, uh, and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the satellite can cover the very broad area. So I think it's very useful for the appropriate urban design with considering the infection risk. So I think it's a very good chance to, uh, how can I say, uh, to commercialize and to achieve uh, based on the open innovation. Uh, so uh, I expect that, yeah, sharing the risk uh, in this uh, ecosystem. And uh, yeah, so that's my perspective for the uh, next five years. Uh, Motosan, as a startup and also being a player in the star satellite industry, do you see yourself when you approach new clients, um, yourself being in the educational kind of uh, building awareness uh, role where you have to educate the industry about what star satellite is? Or do you think that people are already aware about this new innovation? Uh, yes, but uh, actually I think uh, the customer uh, don't need to learn about SAR data. And uh, the, it's kind of an ideal situation is uh, that customer don't need to care about the data source and uh, they can enjoy the just information. Uh, intelligence comes from uh, the analysis with uh, uh, SAR data and other satellite data. So uh, I think that it's kind of a dashboard is very important to show the useful data, uh, useful information, not data for the customers. And uh, then uh, to achieve uh, the demonstration, it's very important uh, step uh, to, uh, how to say, let the customer uh, use these kind of solutions. So uh, yeah, that's why the open data and uh, how to say, uh, open data source and the, the solution development with the data is very important for uh, installation, uh, deliver the value into the usual operation by customers. Yeah, so that's my big point. Winston, you also mentioned in a separate conversation about um, your wish to have a data marketplace. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think right now, in order for people to get data, they have to go to different, different avenues to get uh, data. I mean, even for even for satellite data, the the market is very fragmented. Uh, the the channels that the data go to market is also very different because the different people have different vendors. Uh, it's very difficult to compare whether a data is useful for your particular needs with another data that might, might be useful for another need. Uh, and also, there's also uh, across different data sources from imagery to uh, IoT sensors, they are also very different. Uh, very deep, very fragmented and difficult to combine together in the same marketplace. Uh, if one day, I mean, if we have a marketplace that can put together everything, uh, maybe led by a research organization or led by a government entity within the nation itself, that will be actually pretty pretty attractive for businesses. Uh, a, a small investment will bring back will bring in a very big return, uh, especially in terms of uh, contributing to GDP, make it easier and cut efficiency across across. Uh, uh, cut sorry inefficiency across across work, particularly. So again, there's a lot of consensus from the speakers that should be more public and uh, private partnerships and collaborations. Um, Eugene, what do you have on your wish list for innovation? Um, what would you like to see? I would actually like to see more um, startup and more solutions being proposed by startups, yeah. Because I, I feel that um, um, there's only so much the government can do. I mean, we can take the lead to drive a smart nation vision for, for people. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's also really important for the ground up effort to to, to create all these uh, solutions, you see. Because the, the ground efforts are a reflection of what 
we the problems that we face on ground. Yeah. Uh, one, 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 one example would be, uh, I mean, a, a, a personal interest that I, I always uh, have is, is climate change. I mean, just this, before I logged in this, this afternoon, I was reading about the article about uh, the huge chunk of the glacier in Greenland and uh, dropping into the sea. Yeah, I mean, all, all that is possible, all thanks to satellite imagery. Yeah, we all that we wouldn't know. And that the piece of Greenland, the, the glacier is actually bigger than Paris. I mean, it's just extremely worrying. Yeah, so um, I, I personally would, would hope to see uh, in terms of applications of the urban environment, more uh, solutions that would actually help to mitigate climate change. Yeah, whether it's from a, an individual perspective or whether it's from the industry perspective or the government perspective, yeah, more more solutions would definitely definitely be uh, useful to help to mitigate the climate change impact that we're seeing across the world. Yeah, and also, um, I mean, I, I also feel that it's extremely important for once again transparency of data, open data. Yeah. Um, for data to come from all different types of sources in order for everyone to play a role in, um, in fighting climate change. Yeah. Well, that wraps up the panel. Thank you, gentlemen, for being wonderful guests, as well as being part of the GEO community. And for everyone else, please do check Eugene's talk tomorrow on the URA's uh, designs and uh, infrastructure. And uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.